Tonight, years of scandal, lies and missteps finally catch up to Boris Johnson. I want you to know how sad I am to be giving up the best job in the world. But them's the breaks. The race to take his place and the view from the street. I want to wave him cheerio, but I'd like to know where he has his hair done. <laughs> also tonight, as COVID hospitalizations increase, some provinces declare a new wave. I called my mom, I said, you will not believe this, because <laughs> it's been about 45 days since my last infection. And in the nick of time, a driver in distress, a car on fire, and good Samaritans to the rescue. I was with my wife, and I said, I'm getting out, I'm, you know, and she said, go, 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 go. This is The National. Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing, and we're starting with breaking news tonight. Details about Patrick Brown's disqualification from the Conservative Party leadership race. The woman who says she started it all has come forward. Brown was ousted late Tuesday over what the party said were serious allegations of financial wrongdoing. But details were scarce until now. Catherine Cullen is on this story for us tonight. And Catherine, what have you learned? Well, Ian, this whole scandal involves allegations Patrick Brown's campaign broke the rules when it comes to campaign financing. He has said that he didn't have enough details to really investigate the situation and respond. Well, now the whistleblower has released a public statement saying she discussed this whole situation directly with Brown herself. Her name is Debbie Jo Duane. She says she came to work on Patrick Brown's campaign when he asked her to in May. And here's where the trouble starts. According to Jo Duane, Brown told her she could work for a private company and volunteer with the campaign. In her statement, she says, he connected me by text message with a third party for that purpose. I trusted him, but as time went on, I became increasingly concerned with the arrangement and suspicion suspected it was not okay. She also says she was paid by a third party company for expenses she incurred while on the campaign. So here's the thing. Companies can't donate to campaigns. That would include paying for campaign staff. So this seems to be why the Conservative Party is suggesting Brown's campaign may have crossed the line. And the party has now flagged this to election officials to determine if the law was broken. And what's Brown's campaign saying? Well, Ian, as you know, Brown has spent the last two days vehemently denying any wrongdoing. Tonight, his campaign has shared part of a letter with the CBC that the campaign says it sent to Conservative officials last week. That letter says that Patrick Brown believed that Joe Duane was working for his friend's company and volunteering, but only outside of work hours, which would be within the rules. The letter then says that to the extent she was volunteering when she should have been working, the campaign was ready to reimburse the money. And it says that would amount to less than $10,000. Now, Brown's campaign says they never got an answer from conservatives. We do know, though, that he got kicked out of the race a few days later. Okay, Catherine, thank you. You're welcome. Boris Johnson is stepping down as British Prime Minister. For years, he survived scandal after scandal, but weeks of controversy and a revolt in his own cabinet finally brought him down. In front of a raucous crowd outside 10 Downing Street, a still defiant Johnson announced he'll go as soon as his successor is chosen. Ashley Burke brings us his chaotic resignation and those who say he isn't going fast enough. He fought hard to avoid this moment. Good afternoon, everybody. But the embattled and increasingly isolated Boris Johnson had to admit he had little choice but to go. I want you to know how sad I am to be giving up the best job in the world. But them's the breaks. A jeering crowd trying to drown Johnson out. He showed no contrition, insisting to the very end he was not the problem, his MPs were to blame. And in the last few days, I've tried to persuade my colleagues that it would be eccentric to change governments when we're delivering so much and when we have such a vast mandate. But as we've seen uh, at Westminster, the herd instinct is powerful. When the herd moves, it moves. And the revolt moved fast. The last 48 hours tumultuous. I can't serve um, right. under the prime minister. A tidal wave of Johnson's ministers and aides resigned. That the problem starts at the top. And public pressure grew. It was definitely time. He's uh, done too much damage. We've had all the scandals. Uh, that he has overlooked and denied. Did quite well with the COVID vaccinations. I just think he let himself down personally and ethically. 
But in this Tory stronghold, utter disappointment. Terrible! Terrible! We voted for him. We want him capped. But the Tories are already looking for someone new. It's time to move on and we need to turn the page and do so quickly. The question now, how quickly? Johnson says he'll stay on as Prime Minister until there's a new one. His own party have finally concluded that he's unfit to be Prime Minister. They can't now inflict him on the country for the next few months. In the end, it was one scandal too many. Being Prime Minister is an education in itself. Johnson said in politics, no one is indispensable. He's now learned, not even him. Ashley, so quiet now at Downing Street, but a much different scene this morning. And it was loud, and there was a battle to be heard just behind me in front of this famous door. Johnson was at the microphone trying to resign. This direction, you had people behind the gates who were cheering and screaming and booing. And then on either side, you had government and conservative staff who were trying to counter that by cheering. So it made for a hectic scene here. And, and what happens next, Ashley? Well, the race to replace Johnson, it's already started. There's an MP who's launched a leadership campaign. And behind the scenes, there are many others who are jockeying to do the same. All right, Ashley, thank you. Thank you. Boris Johnson always seemed to find a way to survive scandals until today. Susan Ormiston walks us through the long line of blunders and missteps and why this time was different. It wasn't supposed to end this way. For the populist politician with the wild hair and blunt talk known simply as Boris. The doubters, the doomsters, the gloomsters, they are going to get it wrong again. Boris Johnson made his political mark as the flamboyant two-term mayor of London. A media magnet, unabashedly turning bungling moments into political capital. Gaffes and affairs tolerated. It was just Boris. He could lie, he could cheat, he could do all sorts of things that would have ended the career of any other politician. But the public liked him. We did it! He steered the Conservatives to a massive majority in 2019 and a mandate to navigate Brexit. But once inside Downing Street, Boris's bungles turned fatal. Thrown into the pandemic, he urged Britons to follow the rules. I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. But even after a serious COVID case himself... So we have a temperature. Prime Minister ignored those rules, enjoying drinks parties inside Number 10 Downing and then denying they ever happened. People remembered that when they were in lockdown, they stuck to the rules and Boris Johnson and his team didn't. And I think that's when the public really felt they had enough of him. Partygate was the beginning of the end, followed by backlash this week over a politician he'd appointed with a history of fondling and Boris knew. What message does this send to the British people facing a cost of living crisis while their government is paralyzed with scandal? His party in mutiny. Comforted by his young family, Boris Johnson has run out of bluster. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. We've been following some breaking news out of Japan. Former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has been taken to hospital after being shot while campaigning near Kyoto. His condition is not known. Japan's public broadcaster says Abe appeared to have been shot from behind by a man with a shotgun. A 42-year-old man has reportedly been arrested. In Alberta tonight, what appears to be a tornado has destroyed at least six homes about an hour north of Calgary. It struck between the communities of Olds and Didsbury. Communication was down in some areas. Environment Canada issued severe weather warnings for Calgary and surrounding regions. Now to a dramatic rescue on a highway near Toronto. On Monday, a driver was trapped in his car, doors locked, smoke rising, and five Good Samaritans saved his life. Greg Ross spoke with two of them. In this dramatic video, a handful of quick-thinking men dropped everything to save a life. Hammer, hammer. Oh, yeah. It all started just a few moments earlier on a busy Toronto highway Monday morning. Fabricio Luar recorded as this car lost control. There's a lot of debris coming up in front of me. 
as soon as I merged to the middle, I seen the car just go from the left to the right real quick. I think he was going like a 180. Hit the railing, hit the construction signs. The driver shooting across four lanes of traffic, unable to stop. He had a medical episode that, uh, you know, obviously affected his ability to control his vehicle. We knocked on the door. Uh, we were trying to make sure he was conscious, asked him questions, but he wasn't responding. When Ben Sykes drove by, he saw flames and smoke. I was with my wife and I said, I'm getting out, I'm, you know, and she said, go, 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 go. His wife recorded as they struggled to smash the window. I tried to kick the window in, that didn't work. Tried to elbow it, didn't work. That's when a man in a dump truck stopped and threw them a hammer. It landed, almost made it to the grass and then just ran over, grabbed it. Hammer, hammer. Sykes used it to break the window and open the driver's side door. And then you have to get this guy to the car quickly because you can see those flames already. So I'm thinking like, like just go, 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 go. And so you, you can hear us, we're screaming, get out, trying to rouse him. They dragged the man to safety just in time. Like 15 seconds later, that whole front seat was like, there was there were flames shooting out. The 36 year old driver suffered only minor injuries and has these men to thank for his life. People are calling you guys heroes. Do you feel like a hero? I, that's what that's a label but I think we just I just tried to help a guy that was it in the moment we weren't thinking about that we we're just trying to get the guy out if that was you you would want someone to save you or like in this case a group of brave strangers Greg Ross CBC News Toronto Let's turn now to concerns over COVID in Canada. The chief medical officers in Ontario and Quebec say their provinces are now in a seventh wave driven by fast growing subvariants of Omicron. Here's a snapshot of the situation in Canadian hospitals. After hitting a high in January, the patient population with COVID has fallen. But as you can see this month, there has been a slight increase. Renee Filipponi takes a look at the rising number of cases and what it could mean. It's as close as Kyla Lee can get while in isolation with her third bout of COVID. I've got some heart palpitations and some shortness of breath, but I've had that the other two times as well. She first caught COVID in 2020, got triple vaccinated, but fell to the Omicron strain in May. And then again this week. I was just very mad. I think I swore. <laughs> I called my mom. I said, you will not believe this. Because <laughs> it's been about 45 days since my last infection. Many parts of Canada are entering yet another wave of COVID, driven by highly infectious new subvariants of Omicron, but can overcome immunity from previous affections and vaccines. Something that's a little bit less severe but infects a lot of people means actually the number of total people, total number of Canadians who get sick, very sick, and potentially die can actually be higher. BA4 and BA5, Omicron subvariants barely on the radar in May, made up nearly 25% of cases by June. And according to projections, have skyrocketed to 13% for BA4 and nearly 70% for BA5. It's causing an increase in positivity of tests, a slight increase in hospitalizations, a slight increase uh, in those in the intensive care unit. Uh, so that defines uh, the wave. And Quebec officials are urging people to get their boosters, which they say will protect against severe infection. I think we've said all along that we need to, to live with this COVID. I know we're fed up, but we need to respect that 10 days of isolation. It's important. <laughs> and that means for now, this is as far as Lee can go with her dog Wrigley. Being stuck in isolation is incredibly frustrating. But at the same time, I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I knew that I'd infected another person. As another wave of COVID throws a curve into summer plans. Okay. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. And later in the hour, I'll speak to one of the doctors we saw in Renee's story, as well as the CEO of a hospital in Ontario. We'll look at staffing shortages and how they're leading to emergency department closures across the country and the impact a seventh wave could have on hospitals. The World Health Organization says that over the past few weeks, there's been a nearly 80% increase in the cases of monkeypox worldwide. The vast majority of cases are still being reported in Europe and Africa. In total, more than 6,000 have been confirmed in 59 countries. In Canada, there have been 358 cases. Major luggage delays are the latest hurdle at Canadian airports. Flight disruptions mean bags are sometimes taking weeks to arrive. Ithil Musa shows us how travelers can take the solution into their own hands. 
hundreds of suitcases just sitting around. When Leslie Grossman which, arrived in Toronto from her trip to Italy last month, she was certain her luggage had stayed behind at her stopover in Montreal. I knew that immediately because we had put a tracking device, a little tile, in our suitcases. That device also alerted her when her check luggage finally arrived in Toronto. But getting it from Air Canada, she says, was another matter entirely. She tried their 1-800-HELP number. They basically just hung up and said they were overwhelmed with calls. So she trekked to the airport, but came home empty-handed. It was a week of frustration simply because my bag was in Toronto the entire time. So the fact that nobody could find it, that I couldn't pick it up, that there was no help in any kind of way, was really frustrating. The union representing ground crew, including baggage handlers at Pearson Airport, says it lost 80% of its members during the pandemic, many to layoffs. And luring new workers with slight pay increases and flight benefits isn't working. I can tell you in the last 22 years, hiring an employee at Pearson Airport's never been a problem, and I've never seen anything like this. This shortage of labor is creating a cascade of operational challenges for airlines across the globe, especially here in Canada. According to flight data firm Sirium, when it comes to delays among North America's top airlines, Canadian carriers are the worst, which means one thing. This is going to go on for a very long time. Air Canada says many reasons for baggage delays are outside its control, but it says it's trying to help, letting customers change flights for free if it gets the luggage on their connection. Idil Musa, CBC News, Toronto. Via rail workers have issued a strike notice. 2,000 workers will be on the picket line Monday if they can't reach an agreement with Via. The strike will include maintenance workers, onboard service personnel and customer service staff. Not clear right now how train service might be affected. Economists of Royal Bank are predicting Canada will slip into a recession next year, but that it will likely be short-lived. They're blaming rising food and energy prices, labour shortages and climbing interest rates, saying it'll all push households to slow their spending in 2023. And analysts say recession fears could be helping to push down gas prices in Canada, too. According to Gas Buddy, they dropped about 12 cents a litre in Ontario last night and about half that in Vancouver and Montreal. Experts say more price cuts are on the way. Here in Vancouver, the Assembly of First Nations wrapped up an annual gathering marked by a bitter power struggle. But National Chief Roseanne Archibald has prevailed, the AFN agreeing to a closer look at her allegations of corruption. And as Olivia Stefanovich explains, not everyone is supporting that. Keep your lanyards raised as our team counts. An overwhelming majority for an investigation into the Assembly of First Nations finances. Resolution number one, as amended, has been adopted with 75% of the votes. Passed despite lingering concerns, it could trigger a forensic audit dating back 10 years. If we're going to do this, 10 years is too much. It needs to be something more reasonable and affordable. This chief says he's worried the scrutiny could jeopardize the tens of millions of dollars the AFN relies on from Ottawa each year. There's a lot of nervous people and, uh, and funders being one of them. But the Indigenous Services Minister tried to calm those concerns, saying the government will support the AFN whatever it decides. I would be very adverse to any kind of process that would put uh, ongoing funding for First Nations in jeopardy. Under the resolution, a committee of chiefs will review the AFN's practice of rewarding contracts. Its findings will determine whether the organization faces the forensic audit. We have chiefs who are paid to by their communities. They receive a salary and somehow they're getting contracts from the Assembly of First Nations. To me, that's part of the issue. Still, some chiefs say this is a fishing expedition initiated by the national chief who shared a confidential list of people who received AFN contracts. You are destroying the reputations of those people. I'm here to ask the national chief to, to give a public apology. Frustration over internal politics bubbled over during the assembly. But we can't waste any more time on this. Our people need us compelling some to walk out altogether. We spent two days mired in, in just drama. 
um, my people are suffering, my community is suffering. We go back to our communities and we, we start discussions around the futures of these organizations. So, Olivia, despite the leadership struggle and calls for an audit uh, dominating the agenda in Vancouver, this isn't over. No, Ian. Over the next few months, a committee of more than 30 chiefs chaired by the national chief will comb through the AFN's financial dealings. And based on what they find, they may recommend an independent third-party forensic audit, plunging the AFN into another round of debate and scrutiny over salary payouts, contracts, and even the leaking of confidential information, Ian. All right, Olivia, thank you. You're welcome. A U.S. basketball star faces years in a Russian prison after pleading guilty to drug charges. It was just by accident it ended up in, in her luggage. Coming up, the backroom dealing to try to bring her home. What Russia might get in return. What are you going to do? Nice college boy, huh? From the Godfather to Elf. All right, uh, let's get it over with. He did it all. We remember James Caan. I bless the rain. And if your bus commute is a bit drab, Calgary has a solution. We're back in two. The National, voted Canada's best national newscast. G20 foreign ministers are meeting in Indonesia, and despite calls for a boycott, Moscow's top diplomat is taking part. Sergei Lavrov met with ally China and NATO member Turkey, but Lavrov is also expected to meet on the sidelines with his U.S. counterpart to discuss Russia's devastating invasion of Ukraine, a war that Russian President Vladimir Putin today said is just getting started. Putin said, we hear they want to defeat us on the battlefield. Well, let them try. The Russian offensive seems to have slowed after victories earlier this week in the Donbass, but it continued to hit cities with artillery. Today, Ukraine touted its own victory, showing video of its forces planting a flag on the strategic Snake Island. In Russia, American basketball star Brittany Griner has pleaded guilty to drug charges. She was arrested in February and could face 10 years in prison. Katie Simpson now on Washington's fight to secure her release. With a photo of her wife in hand, Brittany Griner was led into a Russian courtroom to take the next step in her legal saga, pleading guilty to drug charges after cannabis oil was found in her luggage at a Russian airport. She told the court she didn't intend to break the law. She was in a, in a hurry as she was packing, and it was just... By accident, it ended up in, in her luggage. You don't have to say something. The WNBA star and Olympic gold medalist faces up to 10 years in prison, though her most likely path home is through a prisoner swap. We're going to do everything that we can to bring home uh, Brittany Griner safely. And the White House says it will not negotiate in public. Russian media suggests the Kremlin wants Victor Boot released in exchange for Griner. Known as the merchant of death, the arms dealer is serving a 25-year sentence. This yeah. Russian law expert the says the public I, pressure to you know, bring Griner home gives Moscow home. leverage. You know, the Russians hold the cards in terms of how long it takes and they hold the cards as to what concessions they want. Griner supporters gathered at a rally on Wednesday, some frustrated by the slow lurch toward a resolution. I'm frustrated that my wife is not going to get justice. While her family is focused on bringing her home, Griner's teammates say this has reopened a much larger public discussion about equality. I mean, the question is, would Tom Brady be home? But Tom Brady wouldn't be there, right, because he doesn't have to go to a foreign country to supplement his income from the WNBA. President Biden wrote Griner a letter, which was delivered to her in court. He also spoke with her wife to offer what reassurances he could, as this may be a long process. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. George Floyd's killer has been sentenced to 21 years in prison for violating his civil rights. Derek Chauvin is already serving time for a murder conviction on state charges. Today's sentence on federal charges means he'll be moved to a federal prison. 
Chauvin's remarks in court today included no apology or expression of remorse. Actor James Caan has died after a long career that included a starring role in a Hollywood classic. They want to get mixed up in the family business? Huh? Now you want to gun down a police captain? Why, because he slapped you in the face a little bit? Huh? After years of small parts, his turn as charismatic hothead Sonny Corleone in 1972's The Godfather made James Caan a huge star. Later that decade came hits like The Gambler, a loose adaptation of the Dostoevsky novel, and the dystopian sci-fi classic Rollerball. He kicked off the 80s with Michael Mann's stylish heist film Thief. After a slow patch, Misery recharged his career in 1990. He played an injured novelist held captive by an obsessed fan. God's sake. It's for the best. I love you, I love you, I love you! Wow. That was weird. A new string of hits followed, including 2003's Christmas comedy classic, Elf. And he stayed busy. His most recent film came out just last summer. James Caan was 82. U.S. President Joe Biden has honored 17 people with the Medal of Freedom, including Olympic gymnast Simone Biles. At 25, Biles is the youngest person ever to receive that medal. Soccer star Megan Rapino and former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords were also honored. Oscar winning actor Denzel Washington couldn't attend due to COVID. Biden also presented the award posthumously to John McCain and Steve Jobs. After the break, hospitals already under pressure face another Omicron wave. And this comes while emergency departments struggle to keep up or even stay open. I'll speak with two medical experts about the situation and their concerns about more COVID cases. As some provinces face yet another wave of COVID-19, doctors across the country are concerned an already strained emergency care system will deteriorate even further. We do have uh, days coming up in the next two months where we do not have full coverage and uh, at this point, and we expect that there may be more closures. The hospital in Listowel, Ontario, had to close its emergency department over the long weekend, facing labour shortages and burned out staff, and they're not the only ones in this situation. To see how devastating this next Omicron wave could be, joining us are Dr. Fahad Razak, a physician at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto and chair of the Ontario COVID-19 Science Advisory Panel, and Michael Cohen, he's the CEO of Perth and Smith Falls District Hospital, about 80 kilometres southwest of Ottawa. Uh, Michael, you were hoping to reopen the emergency department at the Perth building, but that didn't happen this week. Why not? Well, we had all our plans in place and then uh, late on Tuesday, we got the unfortunate news that uh, yet more of our staff had contracted uh, COVID-19 uh, in the community and we were left with no choice but to delay the opening. Uh, we'll be making an announcement about that uh, early next week. So part of the problem here is people who are actually infected with COVID, but also I guess it's the lingering burnout from this long pandemic. Yeah, after two long years of this terrible pandemic, it's been exceptionally difficult on our frontline staff and physicians. And unfortunately, in the last 18 months, we've seen uh, quite a few people depart uh, the hospital either for retirement or elect to go to take Monday to Friday jobs, in some cases uh, at lower pay, just to have um, a, a bit of an easier time uh, with their work. And Dr. Razak, uh, what are you seeing across the province of Ontario? Yeah, I, I think that story, unfortunately, is playing out at many hospitals. The smaller hospitals are affected because of the fact that staffing is especially difficult in some of these smaller communities. But even at the larger hospitals within major urban centres like Toronto, certain parts of the hospital now are not functioning as well as they used to. For example, the inability to run an MRI suite overnight. So what should we be taking from this? Those of us who aren't working at hospitals, but, but you know, are concerned about what we're seeing here, Dr. Razak, in terms of these surging COVID infection rates that you see across Ontario, what's the takeaway for people? So the, the story for Ontario with the rising rates is actually the story for Canada. We are in the midst of this BA5 wave that has started across most of the country. 
And with that rise, you're going to get these infections that are cascading out, and they're going to affect the hospitals in a number of major ways. The first is that the staffing issues that Michael raised, our staff are burnt out, they're already stretched. Many departments are severely understaffed, so losing additional staff to infections is very consequential. The second is that the actual volume of patients coming in already is high relative to staffing because of the enormous backlog we've had. So if you add any additional COVID-19 admissions on top of that, uh, many of these hospitals are going to have a very, very difficult time dealing with that volume with their existing staff shortages. And yet at the same time, Dr. Razak, we look at, you know, look around and life almost looks like it's back to pre-pandemic normal in terms of travel and gathering at restaurants and, and sporting events. So, I mean, how does the general public balance what we're kind of embracing in terms of lifestyle with what we're seeing, uh, the struggle that hospitals are, are dealing with? I think there's a couple of things that have to be considered here. The first is that our hospitals are our shared, common, and critical resource. So it's not just for COVID-19 admissions, it's for heart attacks or car accidents. So even though all of us clearly want life to go back to normal, we are in the midst of a surge, not driven by lack of attempt to control this virus, but because of new mutations that are evasive and make this very difficult to control. Uh, uh, in, an inability to restrict widespread uh, spread of BA5 is going to lead to problems within our hospital sector. And this is a sector that cannot tolerate further demands. I want to finish with a big question, and unfortunately, I only have 30 seconds for each of you. But Dr. Razak, let me start with you. And that is, how do we even begin to fix this problem with, with these emergency rooms shutting down? So there's the short term and the long term, and I'll, and I'll keep it very brief. In the short term, we need to control the volume of spread of this virus in this wave and heading into the fall. We cannot have a large surge of patients coming in again. Our hospitals just can't tolerate it. How do we protect ourselves? Get your masks, masking uh, requirements out there for public spaces, get your vaccination up to date. Over the long haul, this is about staffing and resources, and that's a much bigger problem. It's about training more nurses and physicians and physiotherapists. It's about hospital capacity. We have among the lowest capacity among wealthy comparable nations. We clearly need to improve that. And Michael, your response? Yeah, we need a Team Ontario approach. Uh, Persimus Falls District Hospital is not going to solve this one on its own. And um, we need to find a, a way to train and produce uh, highly skilled healthcare workers um, as quickly as possible and then retain them um, so that we can provide the care that our communities deserve. And of course, we're focusing on Ontario, but this is a problem that's being faced by emergency departments right across the country. Thanks to both of you for speaking with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Still to come, new media capturing old memories. Pingus, what do you think of your hologram? It feels a little strange when I watch myself. Holocaust survivors are preserving their stories for the next generation. Welcome back. Every year, there are fewer and fewer Holocaust survivors left to share their testimony. And today, another was lost. Canadian Max Eisen, after surviving Auschwitz, he dedicated his life to teaching tolerance and telling his story. That included teaming up with the Shoah Foundation to preserve his memories through a 3D hologram even after he was gone. In early 2020, he spoke with Joanna Romiliotis about the grueling emotional work and its critical importance. We are ready. Max Eisen survived the nightmare of his past by looking forward. Now he's come here to step back in time and relive it over and over again. My name is Max Tibor Eisen. I was born on March the 15th, 1929, in a town called Moldova nad Borvo in Czechoslovakia. This is the extraordinary I, uh, process of bringing I, uh, history I, uh, to life. I was a busy kid. I went to public school. I went to Hebrew school. A 26-camera setup in the Los Angeles studio, designed to capture every angle of Max's testimony as a Holocaust or Shoah survivor, to preserve his story and turn it into a living one. Well, at first, I sort of thought it was kind of eerie, and uh, that means the end of life, and this, you're only on a wall there. But I've sort of come to realize that this is a new technology and uh, it just could do a very big, important job. How were you affected by your experience in the Holocaust? 
Well, it was a loss of family. It was a whole new ball game, as they say, coming back. How do you pick up the pieces? Max is the uh, 25th survivor to be interviewed by the University of Southern California's Shoah Foundation with the purpose of creating a hologram, or a three-dimensional interactive image. It will be installed in museums, brought to schools. Anyone who touches a screen can ask Max a question, and his hologram will answer it. We train the software behind the system to understand sets of questions um, so that when you come up with your own unique individual way of asking a similar question, the software behind it uh, uses machine learning to say, oh, I know this question, and I know that this question means this answer. Obviously, did the Holocaust affect your faith? In the water? Yes, obviously, we need that one. Kia Hayes is in charge of the project. She and her team have come up with nearly a thousand questions to cover off what anyone might ask Max. Why do you think the Holocaust happened? Why didn't more people help Jews during the Holocaust? They come at you with all these millions of questions and, and you can't think out what are you going to say. You need to be fast. And I think that's the best way I can perform. You know, I hear a question and I just give them an answer right away. Max, can you share your picture with us? <clears throat> Yes. Um, I have a picture here that was given to me when I returned from the camp after liberation. So much of his story is about loss. And uh, you will see my father and my beautiful mother in the center, myself. A young boy once nestled in a large, loving family, the only one to survive the infamous Auschwitz concentration camp. Simply losing your entire family and how do you pick up the pieces and uh, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, they simply disappeared and a year later they were not there. The whole exercise is grueling. Uh, there are certain things that <clears throat> I cannot talk about for my own uh, <clears throat> self-preservation. When you were recounting these very awful details, you're not emotional. Is that deliberate? Yes, it is deliberate. I don't want to break down and I don't want to make anybody cry. I want them to learn, you see. And um, I know there are some survivors that cry and everybody else is crying with them. So that's not my way of doing things, you see. Uh, Pingus, what do you think of your hologram? It feels a little strange when I watch myself but I feel that it's so important, uh, the, the actual project is so important. A fellow Canadian survivor, Pincas Gutter, was the prototype. It's actually quite difficult for me both to do it, to relive what I'm talking about. Taking part in this project means Max will continue his work after he's gone. This is amazing to me, you know, to hear this. How do you feel about the fact that you're going to be on a screen like that at the end of this process? I feel, I hope that I'll be giving the right answers, you know. So I think it's amazing. We'll be gone and we'll be still speaking to you from the other side. And um, who would have thought such a thing can happen? Yeah. <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Los Angeles. Max Eisen's hologram installation will be rolled out in Canadian museums first sometime next year, but it will be available for educators to preview on the Shoah Foundation's website next week. After the break, the Calgary Stampede makes a full return. Yahoo! The cowboy boots are on, the griddle's hot, and the excitement palpable. And that's not all Calgary has going on. While you're there, you can belt out a tune while you're on the bus. Stay with us. With our first pick in the 2022 NHL Draft, the Canadiens de Montréal sont fiers de repêcher from the Slovakian national team and TPS Turku, Yuri Slavkovsky. A big night for the NHL and for the Montreal Canadiens. The annual draft was held in their city. They had the first pick, and as you saw, the Habs selected Uri Slavkovsky 
over Ontario's Shane Wright, who many felt would be the top choice. Instead, Wright dropped to fourth overall, chosen by Seattle. The Calgary Stampede is back in full force after two years of cancellations and COVID restrictions. Allison Dempster shows us how the event offers a window into Alberta's pandemic legacy and its recovery. It's back. For the first time since 2019, Calgarians are celebrating a full stampede and they're ready to do it in their usual boot stomping style. I love the energy that is created. Like even right now, it just, it just wakes up the entire city. Things are on the rebound in Calgary and this is one of the first times we get to celebrate that. And where there are pancakes, there are politicians. COVID was a divisive time and division in, in our society and families and, and uh, Let's, let's, make the, let's make Stampede a healing time. Let's have a bit of fun after two really serious years. The Stampede can be a bellwether for the local economy, and this year's celebrations are being fueled by soaring oil and gas prices. This is a comeback for Calgary in a way, and it's also being buoyed by the fact that, yes, oil prices are high, natural gas prices are high. We're seeing that economic diversification. So many different companies are part of Stampede this year that we've never seen as part of it. And when you talk to the Stampede, they'll tell you that corporate sponsorships are back to 2019 levels. A sign of that optimism, this busy warehouse. Event planners in Calgary are in such high demand for corporate shindigs, they're having a hard time finding staff and supplies. But they say it's a good problem to have. Oh, a lot of people are excited to gather and to celebrate, which is wonderful. Stampede organizers say they need this buzz and excitement after the pandemic blew a hole in their budget. We lost $26 million two years ago. Last year we put on a partial stampede and lost $8.5 million. Uh, we don't expect to make it up overnight, but we're off to a good start right now. Organizers say they're planning for more than a million visitors. As Canada's oil capital uncorks a stampede celebration the city hasn't seen in some time. Alison Dempster, CBC News, Calgary. The stampede isn't the only thing making a comeback in Calgary. This city bus is adding a little music to the daily commute in our moment next. You'll probably recognize this, James Corden's karaoke carpool gaining popularity in the last few years and inspiring many to belt out their own tunes on the road. Not that many of us needed inspiration, but if you too dream of singing your way to work, Calgary has the solution, bringing karaoke inside the local bus. This creative commute is our moment. I've left the rain. We're launching the karaoke bus. This is uh, the start of uh, welcoming back people uh, from a long two years. We were tasked with, uh, you know, recovering transit service after a hard two years of the pandemic, and we thought, hey, why not have fun with it? Enhancing the customer experience is uh, one of our priorities, so this is a great start, and we're excited about the summer. I think it brings people together and like something happy to do. It's a really positive environment. Yeah, so I think it's nice to have. <laughs> we're going to be putting it in service next week. Um, so it'll be on random routes. Uh, we're not going to advertise the routes. It'll be a little bit of a surprise. And you never know. Our operators during a time stop or end of the route may jump on mic and uh, drop a verse or two. So I applaud the creativity and the whimsy, but I'm not 100% sure I'd get on that bus. Like, especially since it's not actually replacing the regular bus on that route. If I saw the karaoke bus come by, I might just wait for the next one. Anyway, I'm sure a lot of people will enjoy it. Uh, that is the National for July the 7th. Good night.